We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, by the time you're actually hearing this episode, uh, you will have uh, Lee's review of the SVS SP2000 Pro subs. I am bound and determined to get that out. Uh, and yeah, it was a good thing I mentioned it last week because it didn't get out last week because, um, you know, stuff, life, things don't get done sometimes. I apologize. How? How is that possible? How is it possible? How is it possible that things don't get done sometimes? <laughs> it that never happens in my house with three children right. who are mad at us because we're like, "Why did you not do your homework?" And they said, <laughs> "I did." And we say, "Except for every metric known to man, that says you didn't." <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it never happens, Rob. Mm-hmm. What you talk about? Well, I try. I try my best to put things out when of course I you do. intend and say I will. Uh, of course, I you think do. I think I was very careful in never actually saying it would it would come out last week. I, I don't know why we numbered it the way that you. Insisted it was because that's the way it. we recorded it, and I'd rather it just not get out I, of sequence. I, you know, that's not out of sequence. It's 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 a standalone episode. We we number it whatever number it is when it's time for it to go out. We're talking about six ninety five anyway, and by the time you're hearing this, it uh, it should be that. Except for the live crew, but that's a very small number of people. So. Who knows? We could have millions of people. Just not right being now. told by YouTube. That's right. All right. I'll buy into that. <sighs> all right. This is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You go to uh, avrant.com. Leave us a comment there. Facebook.com slash avrant podcast. YouTube.com slash avrant, which will someday have a video of a podcast with Lee. And his it review. sure will. SB two thousand subwoofers. <laughs> it's detailed. It is. It's long. And well, uh, what else would you expect from AV Rant? You're gonna you're gonna full of- <laughs> see something that's labeled as an episode of AV Rant that isn't over an hour long. You you, you go, what's going it on used here? To, that the, uh, in the in ye olden times, Rob, this was a twenty minute podcast yeah. twice a week. Well, this is what happens when you don't have a female co host anymore. That's right. So I can boss around. Damn it's it. It's my fault. <laughs> It is your fault. It is but entirely that's okay. <laughs> it is a hundred percent your fault. We've all agreed on that. Yep. Only because Rob said, "Tom, what, don't you think we should just answer questions instead?" And I'm like, "Oh, it seems like so much work. Why can't we, can't we just talk about news like we normally do?" This, but wouldn't it be better? <laughs> <laughs> it was the podcast I wanted to hear, and what do you know? That's, here it still is. And Rob, Rob, Rob went from correcting my grammar mm-hmm. to editing my books. To not editing my books mm-hmm. and then changing my podcast to suit his own evil twisted needs. That's absolutely right. <laughs> I wormed my way in, and now years later, I have, I have reaped what I have you're sown. Reaping, <laughs> you're reaping the benefits. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, I already said that I'd get the question answered. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, contact Rob directly. Rob at avrent.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrent.com. My Twitter is at avrent underscore Tom. Now. Let's go down to our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, all you have to do is support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrant.com, click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. Well, I'm starting to speak fast tonight. Mm-hmm. And uh, it'll take you to a PayPal donation site. We want to thank Chris, Neil, Dre, and Michael. Somebody corrected my name. I did. Well, because that's how he goes. But he even put it in his email. Well, I did. He's like, if you I... see this name, this is who I actually am. So okay. Chris, right. Neil, Sorry. Dre, and Michael. Those are four separate people in case we said them too quickly together. And thank you so much for the PayPal support. It's very much appreciated. We also want to thank 109 patrons on Patreon.com, including Terry and Benjamin. Patreon is a service that will allow you to sign up for a subscription to our podcast or any 
content creator who signs up for it. A minimum of a dollar a month they will take from you and give to us. And uh, we want to thank Terry and Benjamin who mentioned that they had signed up. And thank you very much to our 109 patrons. I would like to cross back over into 110, though. Yep, yeah, it went down a little bit, but very understandably in the current situation. Oh, and we my goodness, are not you're not even joking. The least bit upset about that. And nope. uh, yeah, very much uh, a big thank you to everyone who continues to support us. That's still a lot of people. It's still amazing. So that's patreon.com slash podcast. If you would like to sign up or update how much you're donating or whatever it would you would like to do, all of that is is above board there. So uh, yeah, thank you very much to Terry and Benjamin for being two of our 109 patrons. I just want to thank Ash for, uh, if, um, okay, let me back up. I'm very excited about what I just read, so mm-hmm. I wanted to read it so I could be excited about it. But if you can't support the podcast financially, we completely understand. Just find some way to support us and uh, tell, either tell us about it or do it with us as in the case of ash uh we want to uh, and we will mention you so ash sent us some updated artwork for our fast approaching 700th episode i didn't even realize 697 was very close to 700 that is and i didn't think i, I, I mean dude, it's right right there <laughs> and uh so our 700th episode is quickly approaching and ash has sent us some 700th uh episode artwork that i have not seen Though I can imagine what it looks like. Yep, it's not a it's not a large departure from Ash's previous artwork. Uh, all the artwork that you see are uh, lower third that's on our video, uh, our little splash uh, logo and stuff that's up on uh, Facebook and on YouTube. If it's just the generic one, that was all made by Ash. So a huge thanks to him, and he continues to support us that way. He is very very busy right now, so hugely appreciated that he's still thinking of us yes. and willing to do that. I appreciate it, too. A hundred percent. We also want to thank Daniel for, for offering to send me a Roku. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about that last yeah. week, I think. And then I guess, did you forward it or did he just nope, send it? No, he the, just heard the, it and the... did that all on his own, oh. which is awesome. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Mm-hmm. I did accept that mostly because I'm tired of messing with the Xbox. <laughs> yep. Uh, even though they'll stay in the system and we will be using it for many things, including uh, playing my, my kids have started playing games on it again. Why is it so hot in here? I'm going to have to. I do not eat, know. Eat, go, Could be eat, that go, you eat. live in Florida. That might be the problem. Could be that it is. Ju- it was a nice kind of temperate ish day and it's not cool enough to cool down the house, yeah. but not warm enough to kick on the AC. So I want to thank Daniel uh, and I will thank him again when I get the Roku uh, and then what will benefit Roku and Roku users is that I will have much experience with Roku and I'll be able to talk and about it. that's good. It. I don't use a Roku, <laughs> so, so one of us should, and that's a yeah. good thing. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, Dre told uh, Acoustic Panels Canada that we sent him uh, their way, so that's good. Thank you for talking this up to them. And uh, we got some notes of gratitude from Daniel and Mike, so thank you, gentlemen, as well. Indeed, Dre, thank you for talking this up to Acoustic Panels Canada. And Daniel and Mike, thank you so much for the notes of gratitude for keeping this podcast going. And once again, thank you to everybody who continues to listen and keep this community going. It's really nice. All right, so some news here, I guess. Is that where we're on? Yeah. Yes, this comes from Carl. When nearly every movie theater closed, uh, Universal Pictures decided to release Trolls World Tour via video on demand, basically a $20 rental, on the same day that it was initially going to come out in theaters. It made over $100 million. And after three weeks, it has brought in more revenue for Universal than the original Trolls movie did after three weeks in theaters. Mm -hmm. So Universal CEO got all excited and proclaimed that even after theaters reopen, they might release more movies day and date to home rental. Sir, if nothing else good comes out of this pandemic other than this. He threw it out there. He's like, this exceeded all expectations. We we might do it again. (laughs) Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Kids movies in particular. I don't have to take my child to a movie theater full of other people's terrible children. Mm-hmm. I mean, my children are terrible. I don't want to go there with them. I certainly don't want to go there with them with a bunch of other people I who have terrible children as well. This is like, like hand-in-glove fit for perfect <laughs> synergy. I'm telling you. Names. All right. Then uh, Warner Brothers and Disney moved some of their upcoming uh, uh, moved some of their upcoming theatrical releases to video on demand and streaming, and said they were also rethinking their th- theatrical models. Movie theater owners uh, didn't like that, and AMC said AMC said they will now boycott showing all Universal Picture movies until they reverse this announcement and go back to traditional release windows. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be a 
good time to buy stock in the movie theaters <laughs> right now. That's, uh, <laughs> I mean, it is kind of the only leverage they have, but how much leverage really they is. really have right now is uh, kind of questionable. So yeah. No. And then Regal Cinemas joined in saying they haven't gone as far as to say a full boycott, but they are warning all studios, especially Universal, that they won't show any movies that are also released day and date uh, to the home market. Universal has replied that they are disappointed yes. in the fact that <laughs> we are now losing exactly zero money from you since nobody can go to you anyways. <laughs> Uh, Sorry, uh, it's uh, as we've been saying, there definitely could be lasting changes at the end of all this. I mean, it's certainly highly questionable that Trolls World Tour would have made as much money as a home rental if everyone weren't locked right. at home. Uh, yes, and also without being the benefit of essentially being the first major movie that yeah. was supposed to be a theatrical release. Like it was the first one that got announced where, nope, not going to be in the theater, going to be a home release on the day it initially was going to be in the theater. So it was a novel thing. There's obviously everybody is stuck at home. So those things will change how much yes. that'll actually work out. But the point is that it's now at least in CEOs' minds that they're considering such things. It's not a complete flat no anymore. And uh, the cinemas are going to have right. to battle to stay afloat if that I hate forward. to say it. But the, the movie theaters are looking at this in completely the wrong way. They absolutely, the, the theater owners, I mean, I know they're terrified that they're going to lose a ton of revenue. I just don't think it's the case. They will lose some. Mm -hmm. That is true. I think there's no doubt about that. But they are not going to be, I think, you know, if we see day and date, there's going to be the people who go to movies are going to continue to want to go to movies. And it, sometimes I'm going to want to. No, I'm, no, I'm lying. I'm never going to a movie <laughs> again. But then again, you literally lost me going to one movie a year right like when star wars whatever star wars thing well comes i mean out, if they or... can work out some little bit of profit sharing it's actually probably yeah. going to boost theaters because there are a ton of people who just don't go to movie theaters anymore yeah. uh and they'll get a little something from that and also you know what if it um helps keep some of the uh people that i don't want to be in a movie theater with if they just decide eh, i'll just rent it at home and it's actually only movie lovers who go to movie theaters i'm like well i'll right. actually go to movie theaters even more if it turns out that way because the thing that keeps me away from movie theaters are the people not the movies so um <laughs> yeah anything that can have actual people who want to be at the theater to watch the movie of all things um if, if that's what it turns more into then i will go there's very much a chance that I might go because, like, for a single person, it would still, as long as you don't buy a bunch of popcorn and crap, it would still be cheaper to go to the to movies. a single ticket. Yeah, no. to a single ticket, and I might do that so I can go to a movie that I know my kids don't want to see or mm. I don't want to take my kids to, and I know my wife everything I want to see my wife doesn't want to see, so <laughs> that's not a problem. So I could go to the movies by myself and save some money and not have to deal with my kids or my wife, you know, saying, what was happening again? Who is that person with that glowy <laughs> glove with all the gems in it? Like, listen, I'm not going to stop this movie. Just I'll give you the comic book afterwards. So, yes, I, under I understand the movie theater's fears. I They're valid. But I think what Rob just said about uh, some sort of profit sharing uh, or some sort of incentive from the movie studio's point of view that says, hey, you know, make sure, you know, we're going to release at the same time, but, you know, you're going to get a cut of, yeah. you know, the, the, the on-demand sales and therefore, you know, and, it, and if it even means that they can then go into their movie theaters and say, okay, we're going to cut the theaters in half or we're going to you know, somehow change the size of the theater so we can show more movies at the same, you know, at different times and that sort of thing. I don't know. There, there could be some benefits for them out of this. I doubt we'll see that, but we'll see. All right, some comments here. Terry pointed out that Rob might have incorrectly stated some of the cat uh, – the cat cable uh, bandwidth limits. Yeah, we were talking about is... uh, Cat 5 and 5E and Cat 5, Cat 6 and 6A and all that uh, last week. Honestly, I don't know if uh, I misspoke at some point. I, I didn't listen back carefully enough to catch uh, if I might have said something. Uh, but overall, the basic thing is, uh, first of all, I'll have the link where where uh, I took most of the information from, and then he also sent a link where he was taking some of the information from. So I'll post both of those links. Uh, you can have a look for yourself. But the basic idea is that as you go up in the category specification number for ethernet cabling uh it's just that you can do more bandwidth at longer lengths as you go up and up and up in category because they are better at uh shielding and rejecting interference and those types of things so i might have 
easily said the wrong number as right. far as the length uh, pertaining to a certain bandwidth on a certain category number. Right. Uh, no idea. This if is I should... why I let Rob say all the numbers. <laughs> That's right. Because I I get the, I get all that stuff. What I what I meant and what I read and what actually came out of my mouth might have been three different things. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> my the worst thing is whenever I try to calculate on the fly the decibel change per you know doubling of right the, the meters or whatever and i just i always get it's like too hard to talk and do math at the same time so i have to like i would i need my phone so i can press it in <laughs> siri how much is <laughs> all right uh somebody about like 75 percent of our audience's phones just went what <laughs> uh, you didn't say the hey word before it should be all right Oh, is that how you have to do it? Yeah. There you go. All right. Benjamin heard Ian dis describing his disappointment about the Epson 5040UB pro uh, projector's lens memory and how it isn't very precise, and he has to, so he has to adjust it manually if using the lens memory every time. Benjamin found many other people complaining about this issue on the AVS forum, and Epson replied with a bit of an explanation and some suggestions. Basically, there's a sensor that helps keep track of how the lens was moved when you are setting up your lens memories. And if you adjust the lens position back and forth, uh, I mean, going a little too far in one direction, so you move the lens back to get it just right. The sensor gets a bit confused, and the lens memory won't be very precise. So they recommend that when you are setting your lens memories, you only move the lens in one direction for each of the adjustments. So, for example, only move to the right, uh, 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 right up, zoom in, and tighten focus. Do not fine-tune by also clicking back to the left, down, zoom out, and loose, loosen focus at all. Supposedly that delivers more reliable the results, but they still admit that being off by six millimeters in any direction is considered within spec. So it's never going to be 100% perfect. That actually makes sense, I think. I don't know. I mean, it's but almost I... as though it's just memorizing the button presses. So <laughs> I, that's not what they said. Right, they but said it's it, a that, sensor, but it's... That's not, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, right. I don't know. It kind of makes it, it's one of the like in psychology we used to talk about face validity, mm -hmm. which we don't talk about anymore. But uh, face validity was this idea that something on its face, you know, just by just describing it to somebody, they go, yeah, that kind of makes sense. This kind of makes sense, but it kind of makes sense in the way that things that are way more complicated than they actually they're being described <laughs> right, makes yeah. sense. It's like yeah, you know, it's like I could feel that underneath what you just said, there's a whole lot of engineers going, that is totally not true. <laughs> right. <laughs> In any case, this is Epson's own advice that when you're setting up your lens memories right. uh, you know you have it set for let's say it's the uh one that's filling your screen's entire width for a full 16 by 9 and then you want to uh you know you got a 2.35 to 1 screen so you want to zoom it in to fill that and crop off the top and bottom well when you're doing that zoom in if you also need to adjust the uh lens position somewhat that you don't you know go uh, up 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 oh i went a little too far and back down and then you press the lens right. memory button it's like nope get it set, move it just in one direction, and then hit the lens memory to uh, record that. So maybe it'll help a little bit, but it's never going to be perfect. And if you're off by six millimeters in where the lens is, then the image is off by several inches because everything is right. hugely magnified with a projector. Right. So Dennis just wanted to mention, that he's heard us mention SVS quite often. He knows we've sent a lot of customers their way, but he actually found our podcast because he went to SVS to buy a pair of subwoofers and their questionnaire mentioned AV Ramp Podcast, which piqued his in, his curiosity and got him to check out our show. So I guess we should thank SVS for being the listener <laughs> hey, of the week. Hey, two-way street. I'm happy with that. I just thought that was a funny little anecdote. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious that... Uh, like SVS, we get we send so many customers out that way that they actually we get a line item on their survey. Yeah. I think that's that's hilarious. <laughs> uh, Jason, I'm not. Am I supposed to? Say yeah, I'll last say the whole name because he 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 is fine with people getting in contact with him. Oh, okay, so Jason Berryhill is a longtime AV Rant fan, and he wanted to share that he has just launched his own speaker company. Us. Ostinato? Ostinato. Ostinato? Yes. Ostinato. Ostinato speakers. The cabinets are handmade and the speakers are hand assembled in Denver. He's going after the affordable high end, starting with three, three models uh, the 2350 a pair desktop, a 3950 a three way, a pair of three way monitors, and a 2650 each. I don't know what that is. Oh, large center. All of them use a ribbon tweeter and come in three available real wood, world, uh, real wood finishes. <laughs> that is so hard to say, I swear. Check them out if you're interested. Uh, you definitely drop Jason a line and mention AV Rent if you'd like more information. Um, I'm going to click on the link so I can see them yeah. for the first time ever. 
Now, uh, those are speakers. do... N- God, I can't tell. They don't look like Raul ribbon tweeters because Raul always has the weird little sawtooth thingies on either side of their <laughs> ribbons. So I'm not sure what brand of ribbon tweeter that is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm quite in favor of true ribbons. They do have that very nice, uh, very fast transient response by just by virtue of having exceedingly little mass. And that is a big center speaker. It's got dual mid-range drivers in the right. uh, center speaker designs. That's that's a that's a big honking boy right there. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Well, we might take a listen to these. Which ones? What the, the monitors are? The monitors are the three, three ways. Yeah, he doesn't have any towers, but those three way monitors are them's big. They would go on stands. Yeah. They're not floor standers, but yeah, they're not floor standers. Yeah, but I wonder how big they are compared. They look much bigger than the uh, the ultras. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. SVS ultras. Yeah. They look like they're at least a third bigger than the ultras. <laughs> Wow, that 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 would take a like almost a custom stand for those. You, dude, you should also still sell stands. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Jason, you should add a stand <laughs> option to that because that's not going to be an easy thing to find a stand for. I mean, it looks like it's just needs to stand as big as a like a like a uh, cinder block. Mm. I mean, it doesn't look like it needs to be much higher than that. So cool. All right, let's ask, uh, answer some questions here, Grinder. Grinder asks, is it possible for a movie to be playing in a BT709 color 8-bit and still be HDR? I don't, <laughs> don't know. Anyway, he had his Panasonic UB420 Ultra HD Blu-ray player set to YC, uh, YCBCR444 output. And when you press the but, info button on this JVC X790, that's what he said it was receiving as a signal. But then he tried setting this Panasonic player to YCBCR auto. And according to this JVC info button, it changed to BT2020 4220 10 bit in the advice. Um, yeah so that first question the first 444 is the problem i think it seems like the 444 is the problem <laughs> it's a it's a little bit uh, of a thing to get into so on that first question of could a signal be coming out that is uh rec 709 color bt 709 color 8 bit and still be hdr okay so uh, in a really really technical sense it's possible but the largely the answer is no uh, the signals that we are getting, whether it's streaming or off of a disc, if it's HDR, it's going to be at least 10 bit. We have no HDR content that is less than 10 bit. Um, and everything right now is using the rec 2020, uh, color container. Uh, so that, that is the signal that you're going to have if it's HDR. For example, if you're watching Netflix and you're watching something that's in Dolby Vision or in HDR, and then your bandwidth dips down to the point that they can't continue sending you HDR anymore, if you were looking at the info screen the entire time, you would see it change at that point. When it drops out of HDR, it would drop down to 8-bit. Uh, and when HDR mm-hmm. comes back, it would pump back up to 10-bit. So... In a truly technical sense, there are ways to like dither 8-bit color and you could use a lower color gamut and blah, blah, blah. But the effective answer is no. If you're seeing 709 and 8-bit, then you're not seeing HDR. Uh, So what was going on with his UB420? Well, um, they actually have some pretty decent notes, like not in the manual, but on the screen itself when you're going through the settings of uh, Panasonic's Ultra HD Blu-ray players. Uh, So they'll actually note that like, Uh, the first thing you'll see in the HDMI settings is setting your resolution. And that's where I was saying that because the Panasonic players are very good at doing their chroma up sampling, you actually do want to set the resolution to, in this case, the highest thing that's available, which is 4K at 60 frames per second in 444. Uh, And I'll actually note that if you want to get like everything out of the player that you can, that's necessary. Because if you set it to the other 4K option, which is 420, it will limit everything to 8-bit. It won't give you 10 or 12 bit if you uh, set it there. And it even says that right on the screen. But it also mentions that if you set it to 4K60, 444, uh, it will either come out as 444, 8-bit, or 422, 10-bit or 12-bit. So there's a separate section. There's the advanced settings uh, and the color mode within that that lets you lock it to either 444 or 422 output, you can lock it to one of those. And if you lock it to 444, well, it's always an 8-bit. And that's how you ended up with this weird 8-bit signal coming out of your Panasonic player. So if you set that to auto, it'll just switch. Whatever the content is, that's what'll come out of the player. That's what we want it to do. Um, Yeah. That, that's about it. So auto is the correct setting, absolutely. And where I was saying it should be 444 is in that first resolution setting. Yeah. 
All right. <laughs> so we've talked about the benefits of absorption panels on the side walls at the first reflection points, and we've also uh, often recommended having an absorption on the front wall directly behind the front speakers, sometimes even saying to cover the entire front wall if there's going to be a false wall. But what about directly to the side of a front left right speaker? Is there any benefit to having an absorption panel on the side wall directly beside the speaker? There is a benefit to having absorption anywhere you can put it <laughs> most of the time. So is there a direct benefit? So the reason why we are talk, walk, we're worried about first reflections is because that's the, that's the most direct route other than pointed directly at you. That sound will come that will uh, hit your ear next, basically. Mm -hmm. And we want to try to block that from happening because we want to get our direct sound. And then the other way you might get it is to have it bounce off the back wall you know, it could go all the way to the front, all the way to the back again, could be, depending on how you face your speakers. But we're just kind of, a lot of times there's ports in the back. We're just trying to catch whatever sounds going back that direction. The bass will wrap around. The tweeter will not really wrap around the speaker that much. But uh, we just want to try to catch anything on that back front, that front wall there. Is there a benefit to having something directly beside it? Well, if your speaker is directly beside the wall or very close to the wall, that might be your first reflection point anyways. But, uh, I mean, there's benefit to having absorption everywhere in your theater. Uh, we don't often say to put something direct right there because it's not a path that we identified as being one that would be the most benefit. So if you're only going to put a certain number of panels... We're going to try to get the most benefit we can. We want them on your first reflection points. We want them behind your head, you know, on the back wall there. We want them in behind the, 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 the front speakers, and we want bass trapping in the corners. Yeah, and very often people are trying to use thinner panels just because, hey, they right. don't want to take up too much room uh, in their room, and that makes all the sense in the world. And thinner panels can be useful at the reflection points, at the first reflection points on the side walls, on the wall directly behind you, because... Uh, for those specific spot reflections, we're concerned about the upper frequencies, the higher end of the mid-range and the treble, and thinner panels are fine at absorbing those higher frequencies. Uh, but when you're putting panels basically anywhere else in your room, if it's the corners, if it's the full front wall, if it's directly to the sides of your speakers, there we're more concerned with basically trying to reduce um, like boundary gain. You know, If your speakers are spread out wide so they're very close to the, your side walls, well then a thicker panel there might might help to reduce some of the boundary gain that's happening, get you closer to, uh, you know, even linear frequency response again, instead of there being this sort of boost in the lower mid range that might happen just by virtue of being physically close to a wall. So the panels that would go directly to the sides of your speakers, we would want them to be thicker. We want them to be like right. four inches thick with like a one inch air gap, that type of thing, or like basically like a six inch panel, uh, because if they're thin, there isn't much treble that we're worried about <laughs> reflecting off directly to the sides of the speakers. So if they're thicker, it makes some sense for a reducing boundary gain. Jason. So Jason has a 5.1 setup, but when he moved into his current house over six years ago, there were already wires at the top of his wall for front height speakers. He never covered them with the wall plate or everything. They'd just been hanging there. And his wife finally asked him, when are you going to do something about those wires? She probably meant get rid of them. <laughs> But he's taken as an opportunity to install a new pair of speakers. <laughs> yep. He's using EMP Tech Impression Series Towers and the big Impression Series Center. His sub is SVS PC2000. The surrounds are Fluence by Dipole. I remember His... EMP Tech. I kind of miss that company. I, I mean, do it was EMP just RPA. Even though I, I hated <laughs> I hated it. Oh. I hated the the name. Ah, okay. Because I was like, it was a nod to the dealers. You know, just like we were talking right. about with the movie theaters earlier. <laughs> RBH was so terrified. Uh, this was this is like you know, uh, you know, inside baseball talk here. But RBH was so afraid of upsetting their dealers by direct selling the name RBH. They were afraid that dealers were going to drop them and everything else. That they came up with this entire new brand, EMP Tech. It stood for something. I don't remember what it stood for. So they had a direct, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a direct line, which was fine, but it was just silly. It was silly <laughs> to do that when, uh, you know, you know, S, look at SVS. They sell in direct and they sell in Best Buy and everything in between. So... It can be done, but they were a little afraid of that. So, his this, okay, we'll go back to this guy. Uh, his first thought was SVS Prime Elevation speakers, but we often say Atmos speakers should fire straight down, so should you get Prime satellites instead? 
uh, if they're on your front wall, I think Prime of Elevations is like the not only me think that was literally the first thought that came to my yeah. mind was <laughs> Prime Elevation speakers was the literal first thought that I thought of. So yes, yeah, I would get Prime Elevation speakers. This is a little bit of a different situation when we talk about um, Atmos speakers firing straight down. That's if they are in your ceiling or mounted yeah. flush on your ceiling. That could also be the case. Uh, but basically exactly where Dolby wants you to have top fronts and top rears, which is a 45 yeah. degree elevation angle. Basically take whatever the distance is from your ears to the ceiling, uh, whatever that distance is, that many feet in front of you and that many feet behind you. That'll be a 45 degree elevation angle. And if that's what you have, then Dolby are the ones saying that they want wide dispersion speakers at those locations yeah. firing straight down. Because a 45 degree elevation angle is in all likelihood only going to be about four and a half feet in front of you on a typical eight foot ceiling. So that's probably not going to be your front wall. You know, that's going to be on your ceiling four and a half feet in front of you firing straight down. But you're talking about your wires are on your front wall. They're just way up high. You definitely want the speakers up there to be firing at you. And prime elevations are like the perfect choice for that. Yeah. He's also heard us say several times that front heights all by themselves don't add much to the experience. If that's true, he'd rather keep the price down, but he does sit about 10 feet back from the front wall and being that uh, way up high, the distance to the front height should be more than that. So does he want to go, he doesn't want to go so cheap and small that the speakers will struggle. Do we have any suggestions? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, if you want to go cheaper, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I got no problems, but uh, you know, there's not a lot of volume or frequency range that's coming out <laughs> of you know at most up we're up up the up speakers you know it is ambiance it is it is not you're not worried about can it hit 60 hertz at full reference nope, volume don't worry there. about that. that that's <laughs> never never going to be an issue for you so uh yeah i mean i would not want to get like the world's wussiest speaker and put it up there but you can I, I, it's even at 10, 12, 14 feet, I don't think you'll have any problems with anything that will be up there. Yeah, I, th I think um, over at Accessories for Less, uh, they have the Boston Acoustics uh, Soundware 4.5. Oh, uh, those square ones. Yeah, right? yeah. They're kind of a little bit... Well, they're all angly, but... Um, yeah, they have a, they're meant so that you can put them in the into a corner into, like that. Into a corner, yeah, which actually might you, work you out pretty well <laughs> in the type of scenario yeah, I think so too. he's describing. Uh, they also do have just a full ball pivot wall mount that is very easy to, uh, to connect. And um, they are not as teeny tiny as these images you're looking at might make you believe these might make you believe these are teeny tiny little two inch uh bose cubes or something like that but no the like. soundware 4.5 <laughs> is because it's a four and a half inch driver in there and yeah. a tweeter uh separate from that it's so a six inch cube yeah you know, exactly basically. yeah so uh so yeah. i mean they're compact they're not gigantic but they are also not teeny and they're tiny. coaxial aren't they they're coaxial no right no the uh the uh tweeter is actually separate in there it's uh is it yeah. really? You wouldn't guess it from looking at it, but it is. Yeah. Hmm. Anyways, I've heard those speakers before. Those are perfect. Yeah, they're speakers. they're though, eighty dollars I mean, each. So you know, it's one hundred and sixty bucks for a pair of them, but that's cheaper than the Prime Elevations for sure. Yeah. So I mean, if you want to stick with SVS, you're fine there. If you want to go this way, yeah. you're fine there. So I think either way will be fine. Neil, Neil's room is roughly seventeen and a half by twelve by seven feet two inches tall so don't invite any basketball players over <laughs> but it isn't the perfect rectangle since part of the ceiling is pitched and the the very top uh, this is the very top floor of his house it's in a closed space though so not a huge volume of air 17 by 17 half by 12 okay so it's pitched in the top of the pitched area is seven two so. yes that's right <laughs> yeah he has an old uh rock logarithm sub <laughs> oh logarithm Oh, sorry, that just threw me oh, off. Oh, I don't think it is. It's there's no Rourke? th in there. It's a logrim. I don't. I think it's like a Scandinavian name. I think it's not logarithm. It's, it's not, not supposed logarithm. To be logarithm. No, it's Ruark logrim. I don't know, dude. I've never heard of it. <laughs> Anyways, he's. I, I, I guess he and us. We neither. None of us have any idea on specs. And based on our advice, he got an S, uh, SVS SB two thousand that he put in his front left corner. He tried putting his old sub in the rear right corner for that dual sub goodness, but he finds himself wanting an upgrade. The seemingly seemingly obvious thing would be then to get a new SB two thousand Pro that should easily match with this SB two thousand, correct? But then he got to thinking, the PB2000 Pro says it plays even lower, all the way down to 16 hertz. And we've been saying it's okay to use that one ported sub with one sealed sub, right? 
And even if it turns out not to sound great with one ported to one sealed, the PB2000 Pro has the option of plugging its ports and running it sealed, where it claims to play, where it still claims to play lower than the SB2000 Pro at 17 hertz versus 19 hertz. <laughs> but then he remembered Tom's advice: build a cardboard box, and he did. It's big, mm -hmm. too big. Mm -hmm. The PB2000 Pro wasn't going to fit. <laughs> so then he thought, this is this is so fun to go down the rabbit hole with other people yep. and their money, and not my money. <laughs> Then he thought the PC2000 Pro, but that one doesn't have the option to be sealed, and it fires down, which makes him worry since he's on the very top floor. Don't worry about that part. He So that led him to consider the SB3000, <laughs> perfect size, sealed, but it only says 18 hertz, <laughs> so we can clear up the confusion for him. If he can get a sub that plays even lower than the SB2000, shouldn't he? Can we help him climb back out of this rabbit hole? All right. So we have said many times that if you can uh, sealed and ported subs, you can... You can put them together just fine, no problem. As long okay. as the weaker okay. of the two in terms of output and extension, uh, as long as the weaker of the two is sufficient in output and extension, the size. then yeah. the other one uh, is going to have more headroom, but as long as the weaker of the two is sufficient, well, it's fine for the other one to go even louder. <laughs> That's not going right. to harm anything. So the things to consider... Obviously, when you are looking at pairing two different subs together is uh, the first thing that Rob just said, making sure that both subs individually are adequate for your room. Yeah. Okay. As long as both subs are adequate for your room, then step, yeah, that's the first hurdle. Now, what your, uh, let me just, too long didn't read version uh, of this, because I'm going to go on for a bit here, uh, is that once you get a sub that goes lower than the other sub, you're never going to be happy with that first sub again. <laughs> and then we're going to be right back here trying to, to talk you off of the <laughs> PC 4000 ledge. Mm. So um, once you start, you know, once you start pairing these two subs together, so what was what's the problem with having two subs of, of unequal performance as far as extension how low they can play what's the problem there well the problem ends up being that you have dual subs because you want to have even response or a uniform response across your your entire seat mm -hmm. seating area hopefully your entire room but definitely the entire seating area the minute that one sub drops off and the other sub is playing lower for that number of hertz which in this case is like three yes in a literally inaudible part of the frequency spectrum yeah. but i'm telling you this so that later on when you come to me and say i can hear the difference no you can't but th for those three or four hertz or whatever it is you're technically only back to having one sub and therefore, the evenness across the seats at those three hertz that are, in fact, inaudible, but you can feel them. <laughs> Some people will feel it differently than other people. That's the, the concern. And you could so, even have, like, a crazy standing wave down there that, like, people will be like, yeah. why am I feeling this weird pressure wave? And the person right next to yeah. them is like, I ain't feeling nothing. You're insane. No and idea. you can have fun You're with that. You're nuts. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe there's a silver lining right there. Mm -hmm. So... My suggestion to you is to get an SB2000 Pro and shut up. <laughs> or even my... if they still have an SB2000 to sell you, I'd, I'd get right. one of those. I mean, I can see what he's thinking, which is like, maybe he's like, you know what? Across the span of my life, I'm going to just keep right. going up and up and up. So every time I buy a sub, shouldn't I get one that's bigger and louder and lower than the one I already own? And that way I'll just keep moving up and up. But you know what you'll never have is two matched subs that way yeah, <laughs> like truly is... truly matched and, and and to that point which you'll never have is is peace of mind right. to sit down and be able to enjoy something without thinking <laughs> i wonder if that's if that's if that would have been better if both these right. subs were playing at 16 hertz we already know he's Get prone that, to falling yeah. down a rabbit hole potentially are you kidding me he hit every <laughs> rabbit on the way down but the boy was bouncing off a of rabbit. But I mean, given yeah, I, his room uh, size, given that this is an enclosed yeah. room, uh, the SB2000 yeah. should be 100% sufficient in this room. Now, again, yeah. maybe he's thinking, maybe he's not planning to live here forever and ever. And he's like, if I move to a larger space or I go someplace that has an open concept, won't it be to my benefit to have a sub that can play louder and lower at that point? Nah, it could be the case. Uh, but I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't go to like buying a sub that this, physically doesn't fit where you already live. This is from <laughs> a man who sits within arm's reach oh, yes. of two. Was it PC? PC thirteen four, ultras. Yes. Thirteen. What would be now PC four thousands, basically. Right. So uh, yeah, 
I know what you're saying, dude. <laughs> and, you know, I understand that. But for your peace of mind and for your general enjoyment of your home theater, either replace both subs right. or get a, get another SP2000. Agreed. Those are your only two options. Anything else is going to drive you mad. Agreed. So I, I that's what I say. Josh. So Josh uses a pair of KEF LS50 speakers with the SP, SVS SB1000 subwoofer as a 2.1 computer speaker setup. That's a very nice using... computer speaker setup. I was going to say. <laughs> very nice. Did you, did you put the subwoofer underneath your seat and you're like, <laughs> every time you want to just get that massaging fingers feeling, you just play some <laughs> bass sweeps? Uh, but the LS50s, wow. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's the way to live, man. Uh, he's been using a NAD D3020 DAC amplifier via its USB connection. He likes the compact form factor and, and that it can stand vertically. But its display hasn't worked properly ever since it was a year old. And now some sort of audio driver update for Windows 10. <gasps> what? A Windows update has broken mm-hmm. something? Mm-hmm. It's made it almost useless. Well, I mean, at least that's a little bit useful. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, if I, if I keep resetting everything every time I open a new program, it technically still works. <laughs> he did a quick Google search, and many other D3020 owners are reporting the same conflicts with Windows 10. So is there something we would recommend? He needs USB input that will work properly with Windows 10. Now, there's no guarantee that this will work <laughs> in the future. This There's no guarantee. <laughs> He needs stereo amplification with regular speaker binary pulse for his KEF LS50s, uh, a subwoofer output, a headphone jack, and, and all in the compact size with the bonus points if it can stand vertically. Anything can stand vertically if you try hard enough. <laughs> now, I did, That's, let me, I did want to make just... a clarification because trying to find a product that checks all these boxes, uh, it's nigh impossible to find one that has right. actual base management. And I wanted right. to point out that what he's already been using, NADS D3020, uh, it, it does not have base management. It has a subwoofer output, but... Uh, but it's still sending right. a full range signal, not range a high pass to signal to yeah. his speakers. And then it's relying on you using the low pass filter knob on your subwoofer itself to set, right. um, you know, where the subwoofer rolls off. But that off doesn't stop top. your your main speakers from trying to play all the way down the, you know, 20 That's right. Yeah, so. your, your, your yeah. LS50s are still trying to play full range. But I, I wanted to mention that just because basically everything I'm going to recommend coming up is the same as what you're already using with your NAD. None of these have actual base yeah. management. Uh, so you know, I hope you know, that's I'm going to tell you right now, I'm just scanning over this. Some of these options yeah. he's giving you, and he's got a, a literal time. I ended up doing uh, way more research on this than I expected to because I couldn't yeah. find one that would check every box perfectly. There's going to be options in here that it would be cheaper to go to accessories for less and buy a receiver. <laughs> just put but that doesn't floor. have the compact form factor that right. stands that, vertically. That's, that's... So, I mean, I, you know, I'm just going to throw it out there as, you know, Look around your room and remember the speaker wire is cheap and, uh, you know, USB cables are not that expensive either. Yeah. And, you know, sending a USB cable over to a, or a, you know, whatever. You, you can, can use an optical USB. or, optical, or HDMI. Right. If you have an actual AV yeah. receiver, you could put HDMI wow. out of your computer into your AV receiver and send your audio that way. And put it all the way across the room or on some stand off to the yeah, side. Or, or could whatever, it live on top of your remote. subwoofer? Maybe your receiver lives on yeah. top of your sub. Yeah, could be. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to throw that out there yeah. as the option I like best, but let's hear what Rob's got. Here. Yeah, so uh, first place I thought of was Audio Engine, and that actually is what I'm going to recommend to you, but they don't have uh, an all-in-one unit that has everything you want to do all in one little unit. Uh, so what I'll point you to is their N22 desktop amplifier. Now, this is just an amplifier. Now, it's got a headphone jack on the front. It's got a very nice control knob on the front. It does stand vertically. Uh, it's got you know your regular speaker binding posts on the back, but you'll notice uh, it does have a USB port, but that is just for power and updates. It is not... Mm-hmm. Uh, a, it, so this does not have a DAC in it. It does not take a digital signal. It only takes analog line inputs. Now, you'll notice on the back, it has line outputs. Uh, those are full range line outputs. That's what you would use to feed your subwoofer. So again, what's coming out of this thing as far as your speakers is a full range signal. What's being fed to your subwoofer is a full range signal. You would rely on your subs built in uh, low pass frequency uh, filter knob to uh, take out the high frequencies from your sub. Now, and which one was this? This was the. This is the audio engine, the N22. Uh, so it goes for two hundred dollars. Now you'll need a USB DAC, and here you can go insane. You can get 
uh, audio engine's own DAC because, of course, they sell one. Uh, but what I don't like about it, aside from it costing $170, and now you're up to $370 total, is that their DAC also has a volume knob and also has a headphone jack. And, like, that starts being too many volume knobs, uh, in my opinion. So I'm going to point you to Dayton because Dayton has a great little USB DAC that only costs $40. And all it is is a USB input uh, that needs no audio drivers. It's plug and play. And all that comes out of it is left, right RCA plugs that plug into your audio engine N22. And it is teeny tiny and can sit on top of the N22 and you'll never even notice that it's there. Um, Look at these separates we're suggesting here. Yeah, kind of. (laughs) Yeah. That really is a DAC of, you know, it's not a preamp. It's not an amp. It's it's just a DAC, that little DAC. I think just last week we said that there's no such thing as just a DAC. Well, just that it's very rare. Most things we call call yeah. an external DAC are also more than just a DAC. But that little Dayton is just a $40 DAC. Uh, now, if you want a unit that can actually do everything that you talked about uh, all in one, there is a unit from a company called SMSL um, that uh, goes on Amazon. It's only $145. It's their uh, AD18. It actually is all the things you asked for. It's got a display. It stands vertically. It's got a headphone jack on the front. It's got speaker binding posts on the back. It takes a USB input. It also takes optical. In case you run into more problems, you could use optical. And it has a little 3.5 millimeter uh, jack that you can switch between either being a coaxial input or a subwoofer output, which is really weird and almost certainly the reason some people described having issues with it. Um, Right. But... SMSL overall, it is a Chinese brand that, um, yeah, kind of hit and miss on the quality of the products that they sell. I'm not super hyped about it. Also, uh, for its USB input, it does require um, drivers. So whether those will actually work, because who knows, it might be based on the same chip that the NAD was using, for all I know. Um, so if you're willing to go all the way up to 400 bucks, Emotiva does have their TA100. Uh, really nice. Similar to the stealth one that I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, rock solid unit, but, you know, it's 400 bucks, but does have a USB input, uh, has all the things you're looking for, including summed outputs that can be used to feed your subwoofer. Uh, It's just the price there that's a little bit questionable. So, the only ones I could really come across that are like compact like this that actually have base management for the subwoofer output are the wireless ones, like Sonos, uh, their Connect Amp. Uh, actually has a base managed subwoofer output. Uh, Denon Heos, their amp has uh, a head, uh, uh, sorry, has a subwoofer output base managed, but they don't have headphone jacks. So, and they, uh, the USB inputs on those, I don't think actually are meant for connecting to a computer. So uh, yeah, personally, I like the audio engine plus the little Dayton DAC. It's uh, affordable, will sound great, does everything you want it to do. Fun. I'm trying to look at the uh, <laughs> one of these, and it's got so many pop-ups. Like, ah, close the window. or okay, I also we... really do like uh, Tom's suggestion of just getting a nice little AV receiver that, uh... for like 200 bucks. Exactly. <laughs> it does. It does everything and base management and room correction, or at least level level matches everything. Yeah. Nathan. Nathan's friend has a Samsung NU800 QLED. He got it connect. Uh, he's got it connected via HDMI to a Yamaha RX A30. 80 receiver and he's trying to get ARC working. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry for your loss. <laughs> that you, your friend that your friend will never speak to you again after you go down this rabbit hole of pain and suffering. Uh, Nathan's friend wants to use the Samsung's built-in apps, but the receiver only ever seems to play the audio in 2.0 PCM, never in 5.1 Dolby Digital or DD, uh, Dolby Digital Plus. He tried using the optical audio output instead, and that seemed to work for 5.1 Dolby Digital at least, but Nathan's friend would prefer if he didn't need two cables. Uh, ARC should work, right? Is there a setting that needs to be changed? What receiver is this? 80? Yeah, uh-huh. 30, The 3080, that's the flagship. That should work. Oh, that it should. So some it should somewhere something is not turned on correctly. Yeah. It's so gotta be. first things first. Uh, um, HDMI CEC does need to be turned on. In order for the audio return channel to work, HDMI CEC does need to be active. So if you took our common advice of turning HDMI CEC off, that could be the reason why audio return channel is not working. That does need to be on. Uh, That's step number one. Now, the other thing that he described, because he described that ARC was actually functioning, just that it was only ever sending two-channel PCM. 
Right. And for that reason, I think it might just be a setting in your Samsung. Now, you have to dig down a little bit, which is maybe why it wasn't immediately obvious. Uh, if you go into its settings, they have a sound section. And within the sound section, this is on the Samsung television, uh, there are expert right. settings. And within the expert settings for the sound section, uh, there is a, um, a tab called the Digital Output Audio Format. And there is where you can choose if it always outputs two-channel PCM or 5.1 Dolby Digital, or I think those are your only options, to be honest. Is there auto? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at it in person. But th that oh, okay. that is the place where you can choose to just have it always send out two-channel PCM or always send out Dolby Digital. For some reason, Samsung doesn't support DTS output. Uh, on its optical port or on its uh, audio return channel. They just don't support it. Uh, so that's basically it. But I think that is your most likely culprit because if audio return channel was working at all, and it sounds like it was, but it's just that the format wasn't working, uh, then yeah. this expert setting part of it, the digital output audio format should be what you need to change. Max. Max says he's a new AV Rant listener and fairly new to home theater in general. He has his theater in a finished attic space. It's roughly 23 by 15 and a half feet front to back. But uh, being the attic, the ceiling has a steep slope. The back wall is only four feet high and the, while the front wall is 10 feet high. That front left corner is the entrance. Man, this sounds exactly like my parents' bonus room hmm. in North Carolina. It's, it sounds, I mean, it's bigger, but it sounds exactly like that. <laughs> and it's open to the rest of the house right now. That part is not the way that it sounds but anyways i think a door is a possibility the front right corner has a door leading to another room and there are two windows uh, one in the middle of the back wall and one towards the front of the right wall so let's take a look at this that's the right wall and there's the thing <laughs> yeah and we can see the very the steep slope on the back wall yeah. behind his head there Which, it <laughs> very much is exactly the way my parents bonus room was and we my parents wanted to put like speakers on that back wall i'm like mm -hmm. for their surround backs or whatever i'm like that's not gonna work <laughs> but okay here let's see yeah i mean it's a nice little space i don't yeah. understand how it's open to the rest of the the house well though. if you can Is see it... the image where we're seeing the screen like sort of face on uh there's a yeah. lamp on the left and, and you can just see the beginnings of the opening there uh on the left hand that side. goes all the way to the rest of the house that I goes mean... all the way to the rest of the house that's what goes into the oh, okay. stairwell and all the rest of it so yeah. that opening is there but he is not completely opposed to putting a door there at some point step one put a door step one put a Anyways. door <laughs> his equipment list is basically all from the wire cutter it's a benq ht 2050 projector 120 inch silver ticket screen denon s uh 730h receiver polk lsim or ls whatever yep lsim I don't know how you are supposed to pronounce when it's L, S, and M are all capital and the I is lowercase. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's the LSI like I M L series, yeah. LSI M. Mm -hmm. I, I am. I am. I can't do it. Anyways, uh, series speakers and one SVS PB12 NSD that he grabbed up during 2017's Black Friday sale. He has a list of upgrades, potential upgrades in mile mind uh did an x3600h atmos speakers got a pair of upward binary ma modules for now 4k projector and dual svs pb 2000 pro subs i want to know if you feel like your modules actually work hmm. at, as making sound come from overhead because if it does proof positive that it's not bouncing crap <laughs> off the ceiling yeah with that highly angled ceiling indeed yeah so all of these are fairly expensive. So after listening to us for a while, is he correct in thinking that some DIY acoustic panels will be his biggest bang for the buck upgrade? Door. Your door <laughs> would be the biggest bang for the buck upgrade By in the far. history of bang for buck upgrades. Yeah. <laughs> you literally could not make more difference for the base in your room than adding a door. Yep. I know that sounds ridiculous, but what it does oh, <laughs> is it's it's allows your well, I mean from his perspective he's looking at like right. well, how can it possibly be that adding some you are making it so that your base producing thing is not one subwoofer and all the rest of your house. It's one subwoofer and one fairly small room. And that together would make it so that now you're suddenly going to have an experience of bass unlike anything you've had previous. And then, yes, acoustic panels. And then another sub. Yeah. Maybe the other sub first. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, he, he could, I, I could he go could either use way acoustic on that. panels in here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, for but, sure. But, yeah, no, uh, biggest bang for your buck, installing that door. Yeah, the door, yeah. by far. It's so funny. <laughs> it's, I like that lamp. That's an interesting, <laughs> weird lamp. And it also looks like there's a big 
patch of lettuce on a pillow, but I think that's a blanket. All right. <laughs> Uh, he intends to make acoustic panels at some point regardless so what do we think of the following plan, uh, plan super chunk triangles in his two rear corners even though they're very short uh, two or three panels on each side wall he's willing to remove the pictures and whatnot that are currently mounted on the side walls and he's willing to put a panel in front of his window should they be two or four inches thick is a one inch air gap good uh, should we do these individual or are we uh, just do them all no I mean this is all part of the plan so yeah yeah uh, so it's, it's should he make a freestanding panel to go behind his couch in front of the window on the back wall? Where else should he put panels? All right, let's look back at this room. Mm -hmm. uh, well, your ceiling, uh, your ceiling yeah. is where you should put panels. <laughs> that's the first place I would put them. Yeah. I would hang them like. Well, actually, it's not true necessarily. True. He looks like he's already got a panel maybe on right behind that lamp. There's something. I'm not there. sure exactly. Yeah, over on the window side, there's something there with kind of a fabric pattern, but I don't know what that is. And on the other side, there's sort of looks like maybe it's covered in suede, but I'm not totally sure what yeah. that is either. Um, I, 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 you know, so I'm looking at that. He's like a super chunk is in the corners. I'm like, that's great. I like sure. super chunks in the corners, even though they're short corners. That's fine. But what's really going on behind your couch right now? Like, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Is anything happening back there? Do you ever go back there and say to yourself, boy, I'm so glad I'm behind my couch right now? Because I think the answer to that question is nothing ever goes back there, but occasionally the vacuum cleaner. In which <laughs> case, you know, a, a corner on its side is that back, right along that back wall mm. on the floor. You could super chunk that whole thing if you really want to. You could literally just stack up panels floor to ceiling, just lying on top of each other, <laughs> and make yourself all the way to the back, the top of the back of your couch, basically, mm. so that you you've got like just a massive amount of absorption. That little window bay you've got back there, yeah. you could put a pa panel on there, sure. But why put a panel when you could put a big pile of insulation <laughs> just and throw a towel, that, and throw, a, that throw whole some speaker cloth gap in there. You just kind of put yeah. a whole big bunch of insulation going up there. Yep. Yeah. I, I mean, okay. So what Rob's saying about the, your angled ceiling part is yeah. really true. This is now really a, it's very rarely the case, but it is a first reflection point for you because you're going to get whatever, you know, because your dispersion is, is, you know, whatever it is, but it's definitely wide enough uh, vertically so that there's some sounds going to hit that and then bounce straight back down to you. Yeah. Uh, or very close to you, or close enough that you're going to be able to perceive it. And I would want to catch that. And so, in this instance, we are talking about a reflection point. We're talking about higher frequencies that could potentially be muddying up your dialogue and that type of thing. So they don't have to be super duper thick to still make a very noticeable difference. Yeah. And that's a good thing because obviously, you know, where his seat is, the ceiling is very close. You don't want to have four, six inch thick panels hanging down from the ceiling there. But, you know, this could literally be the case of like one and a half inch thick batting or a basic insulation just right against the ceiling and some fabric over it to make it look nice. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's getting rid of a big problem, which is that huge angled section of ceiling right above your head when you're sitting It doesn't down. have to be huge. You, you, you could put like a two foot, square panel and what i would do is just sit in each seat mm -hmm. basically and have somebody take a mirror and put it above you until you can see a speaker yeah you know? and then that you're like mark that spot and then that's sort of the middle of where the panel is going to go and then sit in the next seat and do the same thing uh for each seat i would do that uh, i think putting a panel behind your head uh, on that window is not a terrible idea. I think it's a That's perfectly fine, fine idea. And, and I don't actually, really see I would a lot of sound reflecting off of it, but yeah. I would say in this particular room and with these particular speakers, because these are Polk's LSIs, which use that ring radiator tweeter, which is very beamy. It's a very yeah. beamy tweeter. And you've got a wider than long setup. So in this instance, I'm actually a little bit less concerned about your sidewall reflections than a lot of other rooms with a lot of other speakers. You've got a scenario where I think the majority of your issues are the angled part of the ceiling directly over your head and that space directly behind your seat. I, I would focus mostly on having your treatment in this room there. Uh, now, if you right. want to put a panel or two on your side walls, you know, one that's standing up in front of the window on the right and then matching that on the left. Heck yeah, absolutely. That's, that's still going to be great. But I wouldn't anticipate you hearing a big, big difference because of the orientation of your room and because of these particular speakers that you're using. Yeah. Once you put that door in, the first thing That's you're going to notice is that, is that you're going to have bass problems. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to be like, oh, wow. It got a lot louder in here. <laughs> and uh, it's also totally not 
as even as it was, or maybe it's more even, it could be, but chances are it's going to be like, wow, this is really loud. You know, some things are really loud in the seat that aren't in this other. Getting some treatments in here, some base trapping behind mm -hmm. your couch, like we were talking about, just as much insulation as you can. And then we'll start talking about a second subwoofer uh, at oh, that yeah. point. Uh, the rest of your upgrades, what is he? The Denon, the what, what receiver does he have? Uh, he's got an S730 uh, or 740, I think he said. One of those two. Uh, okay, I don't, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, at, the Atmos speakers would be last on my list yeah. of all of these things. I mean, I really don't see a whole lot of benefit here for that. A 4K projector would be great. Sure. I think I think it, I would go door, mm -hmm. room treatments, and probably room treatments and second subwoofer at the same time. And then I would go for the projector. Uh, yeah. or, or, you know, I'd go for the, maybe the receiver projector. I could go either way. Yeah. You did a lot of sound upgrades. So you'd probably treat yourself with a <laughs> video upgrade thing <laughs> and all that. Uh, okay, Brian. This comes from Twitter. Uh, Brian brought, bought a Harmony Elite, and it's been awesome. His wife even got a movie playing for the kids without any help from him, so that's gone over very well. One small gripe is that pressing the off button works for everything except his JVC NX7 projector. He figures it's because the JVC actually requires you to hit the standby button twice to turn it off. It asks you to confirm that you really want to power off, so is there any way to fix that? That certainly should not be the case. Uh I mean, I, I know that it asked you that, mm -hmm. but the Harmony should have that uh, that functionality because I've never met a projector that didn't require you to <laughs> set, press the off button twice. They always do, and that I, I and I as I sit here and listen to this question and read this question, Brian, I'm looking at my receiver. I noticed at the very beginning of this podcast when I hit the off button, it turned off everything but the receiver, and it very mm -hmm. rarely does that, but it does that occasionally. On occasion. So, yeah. This could be an instance, though, where just the basic programming didn't put a long enough delay between the yeah, first be. press of the standby and the second press of the standby. Um, and since it is unique commands for on and standby on the JVC, uh, what you can do, so this being a Harmony Elite, um, I mean, one of the tips with the Harmony Elite is there are three ways to make programming changes um, because right. you can use the desktop software, you can use the app on your phone, and you can use, uh, like, just on the remote itself, you can make changes. Right. And not every setting is available in every method which is annoying but it's one of the things where you're like i can't find out how to figure out how to do this say using the app it's like well maybe it's in the desktop software so one tip is to just be willing to look through all the various ways of controlling this but um for any of these uh in the activities there'll be a uh like off sequence it'll actually say here's what commands are going to be sent when you press off and you can add to that sequence so what you can just do is add in a given delay it'll be a little bit of trial and error to figure out what's the least amount of delay you need to add in there but you can add a little bit of delay and another press of the standby yeah. button and yeah. uh, that'll be a little bit of extra manual programming but they should definitely be able to get that to work all right he says the av excel podcast didn't know that existed, but okay, it's a thing. Briefly arose from hiatus. Didn't know you could go on hiatus. This is a thing I should explore. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds like I don't ever want to do this podcast. If that were true, I would not have done this podcast for... No credit, Tom. You get no credit for having been here all these years. How many? When We started in 09, right? Is that right? I don't know. I think so. And oh, no, so you've, been, you've been here years. longer than that. I have to check. I think it might have been 07. <laughs> All right. Anyways, every time I say stuff like that, people get mad. Yep. <laughs> Somebody sends me an angry email. That's right. Well, if you don't want to do the podcast, don't do the podcast then. <laughs> if you don't want to listen to the podcast, don't listen to the podcast. Who's forcing you, man? <laughs> it's certainly not me. <laughs> Anyways, they mentioned how it's possible to use the HD Fury Vertex 2 to take Dolby Vision signals and turn them into HDR10 signals that projectors can use. Is that true? And if it if so, would it be of any benefit on this JVC NX7, which already uh, analyzes HDR10 signals frame by frame and adjusts automatically? I thought that Dolby Vision was <laughs> metadata on top of HDR10. So how does this HD Fury Vertex do anything yeah it's an interesting thing so i mean okay so on discs dolby vision is a superset of hdr10 there is h there's an hdr10 on all ultra hd blu-ray discs to begin with um yeah. and then if it is a disc that also supports dolby vision that is there as a superset um that basically goes 
further than HDR10 does. It goes up to 12-bit and it has this frame-by-frame -frame metadata that can only be understood if your uh, player and display have Dolby Vision decoders built into them. Right. So uh, basically the Vertex 2, it kind of, so you've connected it to a projector and other than that one uh, projector that Vincent Tio <laughs> reviewed last week, uh, that none of them have Dolby Vision decoders built into them. So the HD Vuray ver Vertex like spoofs it. It reports to the source that you do have a Dolby Vision display because uh, the Vertex is, you know, the little HDMI EDID editor that sits in between and do all, can do all kinds of fun, fancy things. So it reports to the uh, source that it is a Dolby Vision display. Uh, it takes that Dolby Vision info and... Uh, so is is it possible? Yes, it is possible. Is it easy? No, it's not easy uh, because it definitely depends on exactly what display you have. Uh, it has to be a source that can output the low latency version of Dolby Vision, uh, which came about because of Sony and how they implemented Dolby Vision, but that's actually working to tinkerer's benefit now it has to be the low latency version um and so what you do is you program into the uh the hd fury vertex 2 uh you have to create a custom edid uh that basically understands the capabilities of the display to which you're connecting it and it will take the dolby vision information and it will convert it into a new hdr10 signal that is like closer to the capabilities of your particular display and the whole idea is that everything is supposed to look a little bit better than if you just fed the you know static metadata hdr10 directly to your display like the dynamic tone mapping do that anyways i mean isn't it the whole well yes he that? the second part of his question is does he need it for his jvc nx7 the answer is, answer is absolutely not uh your nx7 does a fantastic job of just ignoring all the metadata like i kind of want every display to do and just analyzing the signal frame by frame and going, well, here's how I'm going to display it. It does a fantastic job. You do not need this. But there are some other projectors where it's possible to make it look even a little bit better, uh, as in all details are uh, retained, nothing is clipped off at the top. And um, in order to retain all that detail, it doesn't drop the overall light level of everything else to the point that all your shadow detail is crushed, right? It, it can work better, but it's quite a bit of tinkering. I've got, actually got a link um, that, you know, describes the various methods for various displays. So I'll put that link there for people who want to play around with it. Please don't ask me for specifics. I am not willing to dig into this. I'm not going to walk anybody through a step-by-step -step thing. You can follow the instructions in the link because uh, I don't really think this is super worthwhile. But for tinkerers, uh, it's something that can be done. It's kind of cool. It is cool. So, But it, and it, there are people right now who own that projector and have the Vertex, whatever mm -hmm. it's called, too, and will are throwing their phones or whatever device it is on the ground and cursing the name of Rob because they have tried it and it absolutely made a, a huge difference. Sure. Everything is, you know, and uh, with their JVC and X7 projector. Oh, to them, I, say, I doubt that. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, you, how much does that Vertex thing cost? $400. Yeah. You spend four hundred dollars on something. You're th there's a part of you that's that's gotta believe that you didn't just throw your money down the tube. It usually takes you a while to get to the well. I mean, the I, point I, where I'm not going that, that far. I, I, there absolutely there's a technical reason why this could retain more well, details, both saying. in shadows I, I, and highlights. Absolutely. Here, here, I. There's so many ways in AV to just spend a lot of money to get just the just most minute of you know, of uh, performance increase. And I just, that's one of the things that I personally rail against or I'm more <laughs> worried. I am much more worried about the guy putting a door on his home theater and getting a right. massive difference than somebody saying, hey, could I possibly get a 0.001% No, I mean, this This is a this my... is a tinkerer thing. This is, this. Yeah. I have no problem with it. The, the, technically, it absolutely does make a real difference. But in the case of something like an NX7 that has, I mean, it, that's, that's not entirely unique. LG actually does have a projector that does dynamic tone mapping as well now. Um, right. You know, they sort of borrowed that processing from their OLEDs. Uh, and that's great. You know, the more projectors that can do that, uh, the less we'll have to worry about a, a tinkerer's solution like this. Hmm. Jack, 
Jack is trying to decide how to finish his ceiling in his basement. Roughly half of his basement will be used as an open concept bar, exercise room, and theater area. It's a regular shape, roughly 55 cubic feet of air, and the stairs will have a solid core door at the top. I remember this room, I think. I don't think so, because as far as I recall, this is new. Um, this is new? This is new to oh, us. So many rooms sound like this. All yep, right, but um, as a basic sort of description, it's almost like a U shape is the total yeah. open area that's going on here. There's a there's a washroom that sort of makes the uh, you know the the dip in the U, uh, but that has right. a door on it, so that can be closed. And then the rest of the basement over to the left of the diagram that can be closed off. But he's got this theater area that's like one side of the U that opens towards yeah, like the back of that. Of yeah, 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 that opens to the back of that to like a bar area and then over to the left is uh, the exercise room and then the hallway that leads to the stairs and the washroom and that okay so the ceiling height is limited so a drop tile ceiling is an option the joists are also definitely unlevel so since whatever the drywall is attached to will need to be leveled anyway he figures it's an opportunity to use resilient channels or sound clips plus hat channels mm -hmm. He's in northeastern Ohio, so winters get cold and summers get hot and humid. He's putting a lot of budget and effort into HVAC as a result. But uh, for a space this large and just the way the basement is constructed in general, a dead vent won't work. Yeah, you'd have to yeah. close something off. So the plans call for two force air supply vents plus an air return. And on top of that, he will have a mini split system for further heating and cooling. With the ceiling already being a bit low, he wants to use recessed can lighting. The full open concept space will have 20 can lights and also wants four atmo speakers in the theater area so this is a rendering or this is the actual thing this is a rendering think, yeah this is a rendering that, uh, okay. to give a rough idea this is sort of standing in the bar area and seeing into the equi uh the uh, exercise room and the theater area yep. yeah i mean it looks nice on the rendering in the rendering so it looks nice First up, we found a, pro uh, a product called the Quiet Box from ISO Store. It's just an outer wood box with a 5 8 inch drywall inside an acoustic sealant, but it comes with isolation clips for to attach it to joists, and they're only $60 each, which seems reasonable compared to a lot of the dedicated speaker back, bo uh, speaker back boxes or the Dyna box options. Do we think the Quiet Box will work for his Atmos speakers and also for his can lights? Quiet box from the ISO store. Let yeah, uh, I'm actually uh, quite pleased that you found this thing. I didn't know about it. Um, now, this is the sort of thing where you could probably build your own for even less. So that is something to potentially keep in mind. But of course, that means some amount of labor or if you're paying someone else to do it, it'll probably end up costing just as much or more. It is a much more reasonable price. Like the Dyna boxes are over $100 each. Those are the vinyl ones that you can roll up and retrofit. You know, obviously. Is that MDF? It looks like MDF. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's MDF or OSB exactly. I mean, that's just sort of a picture of it that uh, is being shown. But I mean, it's it's just that plus drywall, some acoustic sealant, and then, you know, isolation clips to attach it to the joist. But I mean, absolutely, that is fine. There's that That is the perfect thing to use as a backer box or as a, a back box for your can lights. So I think that's a good solution. The only question to me is, is could you make them yourself for even cheaper? Because they're not super complicated. Just be some time and effort. All right. Since he has uh, to have the two, the two forced air supply ducts and the air return, is there even any point to worrying about soundproofing? I mean, how much do you love the rest of your family, I guess? <laughs> All the people who are not going to be down here? I mean, I mean, you can reduce... Going from not worrying about to not doing anything is, you know, not being crazy about it and not right. doing anything is a huge, huge step. So yes, I would worry about it. Would I be, tell my family, you're never going to hear anything coming from downstairs. You know, you, it's going to take a lot of money to make that happen anyways. And you probably aren't going to ever be willing to spend that. Cause I know I wouldn't be. Yeah. Like so, you're not going to be you able know, to, you can reduce it, avoid all flanking paths altogether. That's, that's just out of the cards. You're right about that. But in terms of what you can do with the HVAC that you're going to have installed, there are things that you can do there right. to reduce, not completely eliminate, you're right about that, but to reduce how much sound transference there is. Because, I mean, it looks as though, you know, this is the basement, I'm assuming, on the other side of this U-shaped section is going to be the utility room somewhere. Uh, right. And I'm assuming that that's where the air return is going to go. Now, if you uh, decouple the air return vent Right? So instead of it ha that vent being attached to a solid piece of metal that goes through a solid metal duct back to your furnace um, or the rest of your HVAC system, 
uh, the main trunk, if you have that vent where the air return is connected decoupled with a, uh, usually what they have is like, a, it's two pieces of metal and with some like canvas in between. So it's almost like a little spring in between. Yeah. So that if there yeah, is yeah. vibration, it doesn't mechanically transfer through that whole big metal duct. Uh, it's been decoupled. And if you make the forced air uh, supply vents, um, again, either... I'm not usually in favor of making them all the, um, you know, the sort of accordion soft style because right. that that is inefficient. Uh, but again, if you have just a section of them that is decoupled, again, they have the ones where it's it's basically just a piece of canvas that goes in between two metal sections and it decouples it. Uh, it, it can reduce the sound transference significantly uh, because you just don't have that mechanical transference of sound through solid metal ducts everywhere. So definitely, I mean, that's something that should definitely be doable. Uh, and at that point, uh, you're right that like, I don't think it's worth going to the crazy soundproofing, build a room within a room, everything's decoupled, two layers drywall, all that. I don't think it's worth doing all that, but you're not at the point where I would do nothing and give up entirely. If you've decoupled your HVAC, you've reduced it somewhat, let's put a little bit of effort, uh, the effort that makes sense into soundproofing this space so you can use it the way you want to use it. All right. He's basically thought up four levels of construction. What do we think makes the most sense in this situation? Level the ceiling joints with uh, basic shims. Attach the drywall directly. Install the can lights with no backer boxes. Obviously, no. do more than that. Basically, <laughs> yeah, this basically does nothing for soundproofing. But if the HVAC already makes any further efforts pointless, this would be the cheapest. Yeah, don't do that. No, you can That's, do better than that. You can do better than that. So use resilient uh, channels to level the ceiling. Attach one layer of drywall to these and put the quiet boxes behind every can light and Atmos speaker. It's the second one. That's pretty I, that, reasonable. That seems reasonable. I think we can do a little bit better. Mm. Put a continuous layer of mass loaded vinyl onto the ceiling joist first, then put sound clips and hat channels below that. Is he correct to thinking to think that the mass loaded vinyl could provide a sort of sealed barrier in this way? Now, I wanted to talk no. a little bit about this because actually over on Facebook, Damien um, put up a video with a, a, a somewhat similar thing where they had put mass loaded vinyl on the walls. Um, and so what they had done is put the mass loaded vinyl layer directly right. onto the wall framing, or in this case, he's talking about putting it directly onto the ceiling joist, then putting the sound clips and hat channels on top of that layer of mass loaded vinyl, and then putting your drywall onto the sound clips and hat channels. That is terrible. Never ever do that um on the one side soundproofing company will talk all about how you've just created a triple leaf so you have the exterior wall you know whatever's on the other side of your walls then you have this mass loaded vinyl layer that's essentially a second wall there and then you have a gap between that and your drywall you have a triple leaf which has just created this resonant chamber in between your drywall and the mass loaded vinyl that is a horrible thing to do but worse than that uh, like 10 times worse than that is you You've just created mold for days. You will have all the mold you could ever mold by doing that. That is, you do not want that air gap between your drywall and the mass loaded vinyl. So I know that that construction is like touted in some places. That is horrible. Never do that. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Anyways, uh, the, uh, the fourth one was channels to level the ceilings. Mm -hmm. uh, two layers of drywall or a layer of drywall. And plus a layer of mass loaded vinyl, quiet boxes behind all lights and the Atmos speakers. I like two layers of drywall, the channels, and the quiet boxes. That's what I like. Or if you're going to do two layers of drywall with green glue, it would be even better. Even better. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I will tell you that if you're trying to save as much height as you can, resilient channel is fine. You don't have to go to the um, thicker, you know, just in, in construction, sound clips plus hat channel. Resilient channel, totally fine. Uh, definitely do that because you got to level your ceiling somehow anyway. So why not make it something right. that decouples the drywall from the joist? There's, I mean, I, I think it's actually cheaper <laughs> to use resilient channel. So definitely do that um yeah uh definitely do the backer boxes for sure um and we're gonna do the thing that i talked about decoupling your hvac uh ducts so really the question is is it one layer of drywall or two uh if it's gonna be two layers of drywall you might as well put the green glue in between them it could be a little bit less expensive to have drywall plus one layer of mass loaded vinyl and those two things are together they they are not separated by any sort of gap they are together uh, but if you did that, you'd want to glue it down anyway. Uh, and green glue would be the way to go there too for that. So right. um, 
yeah, it's really, are you going to do just a single layer or two layers? I, I agree with Tom. If you can do the two layers and instead of it being like one five eighths inch thick layer of drywall, do two half inch thick layers of drywall with green glue in between and that will be superior um if you can do that if you really really can't just because of price or whatever it is um you know what he said as as option two if you go with five eighths the eight inch thick drywall one layer of that um but you know everything with backer boxes and on resilient channel i'm like that's that's okay that's okay it's not as good as two with green glue Right, and then just remember that you know that it doesn't stop there. You've done the ceiling, but mm -hmm. you got to worry about decoupling the walls as well, uh, to a certain extent. And then uh, any any other flanking path yes. for sound. Yes, any gaps you want outlets, putty, mm -hmm. and acoustic yeah. sealant. Yeah. yeah. So on a different topic, he plans to have an acoustically transparent screen with a false wall at the front of his theater area. With the plans he has in mind, it would only be 15 inches from the physical front wall, maybe as much as 18 inches. He's strongly leaning towards a Sen Sierra Raw speakers, the Sierra 2 and Sierra 2 EX bookshelf models are about 11 inches deep and they're rear ported. So is 15 to 18 inches not enough space or will that be all right? Uh, well, and they're about, I mean, Rob's gonna... they're about 11 inches from front to back, the speakers themselves. Right. Uh, so that's where the port is going to be if you have mm -hmm. it like right on the front. But you'd also want to have like two inches from the front of the speaker to the screen. That's what's recommended right. for a woven screen. So now you're talking about if it's only 15 inches from the false wall to the physical front wall, you've only got two inches from the port yeah. on the back to the wall. I mean, is that enough space? The answer the, for the speaker manufacturer is going to give you is no. You're going to need more space than that but. i mean dave honestly he says three inches is fine so if you right. can make this space between your false wall and the physical front wall 18, off. 18 inches if you can make it 18 yeah. inches that's enough um i would take off the grill for sure oh, oh yeah <laughs> just yeah. yeah just to give you a little bit more space there but but eight, 18 but, uh, inches would be enough um and and what we can do since you're putting up a false wall is that whole front wall has insulation on it and uh, yeah. now we aren't very worried about the rear ports at all. But there is another potential solution, uh, although it does actually cost a little bit more, uh, which it's is not. they have their Luna series of speakers now. Called it. I was about to say Luna. That's <laughs> right. Like, and uh, given the distances that he's talking about, you probably would not want to go with the teeny tiniest little one that they have, uh, the $1,200 prepare Luna. You probably would want to go with the Luna Duo. Uh, which is, you know, like a woofer, tweeter, woofer design. And it has the same output and power handling capabilities as the Sierra 2, but in a thinner front to back and front ported design. Mm. So that's almost ideal for mounting behind a screen. Uh, but right. it does, interestingly, even though they physically look smaller, they actually are more expensive than the Sierra 2. Uh, right. is the uh, Luna Duo. But the Luna Duo could, I mean, then you're not worried about space at all. So uh, right. either way, this is definitely doable. Okay. John. John went with several AV Rent product recommendations. He got a Den X3600H, a monoprice monolith seven channel amplifier. We recommended that. And a Sandus <laughs> Center uh, speaker stand. He's very happy with all of those along with his Paradigm speakers. But one of them was not an AV Rent recommendation. It's his Omni Mount equipment rack. He hasn't heard us mention Omni Mount uh, as a brand. So he's just curious what we think about them. John says his AV27U model is well built and he really likes that it comes with built in cooling fans. Uh, so what this is is a rack system and we don't talk about this very much because almost nobody has them. Uh, it's a very uh, outside of professional installations. It's not something that most people have. What a rack system is is uh, essentially think of it as like uh, a like one big metal box that ha that is a, a a set size no matter what manufacturer does it. And this allows you to take your equipment and what you, if you look at the size of your AV receiver, you almost certainly see towards the front and uh there'll be like two screws on either mm -hmm. side and what these do allow you to mount these ears okay and they, they come off and they, these ears are like l brackets that you then attach to your receiver and then you attach those to this uh this rack system and then that rack will then be able to 
uh, hold it in place and then the whole rack sometimes the whole thing will slide forward or you know sometimes slide out and then turn so that you can access the back of all your gear easily uh, they are usually pretty expensive uh, not always, but usually pretty expensive. And uh, they're very convenient for people who are uh, always cha uh, never changing gear, but when they have access to the gear when they do in, in an easy way. Uh, they are a nightmare for me because it's just, <laughs> uh, just one more way of me messing up my cable management, mm. which I is, I'm looking at the rat's nest that's back there. It just stresses me out. So. <laughs> Uh, but it, 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 these things can work very well. And when you're putting all this equipment very close to each other, ventilation becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. So having in uh, fans built in, with it forces air through all your equipment so that it'll cool everything off. Uh, pro tip, don't put your Xbox 360 on the bottom <laughs> of your rack. Because <laughs> everything above it gets all that heat exhaust. It gets cooked. Uh, I did have a type of a rack. Uh, it wasn't quite like that, but it, it did have cooling fans in the whole nine mm -hmm. yards. Uh, when I lived in Jacksonville for a little while, I don't remember what became of that thing. I think I don't remember, but I had there was like a shelf at the bottom, and I just put I put the 360 at the at the bottom of this thing, and it cooked everything. I mean, nothing broke, but I was like getting all sorts of weirdness going on. I would go oh I'd go in there like the the volume knob would be hot on my mm -hmm. receiver. I'm like okay, this is a problem. So I actually took the the Xbox 360 and put it on top not on the inside the rack on top on top of the rack outside of the rack that was <laughs> it was cooking everything yes and so, the, the uh, name you'll very often hear with equipment racks is middle atlantic uh middle atlantic. and they are very expensive uh and for yeah. that reason whenever racks come up for a recommendation i almost always recommend peerless uh because yes. peerless has some nice entirely suitable racks for like av equipment when you're not talking about like a server farm uh for av right. equipment for a home installation the ones that peerless makes i think are great and they're quite affordable uh, and so he's right i haven't you know traditionally recommended omni mount so he wants to know what we think about omni mount now honestly I used to recommend Omni mount all the time, like years and years ago, because they used to have a whole bunch of uh, speaker wall mounts and TV wall mounts and all that type of stuff. But a ton of their stuff, right. they discontinued. Um, mm. And they sort of went a little bit more towards the professional side, because I guess that's where uh, it made more sense. The money made more sense for them. They, they weren't doing as much consumer grade, consumer price stuff. So as a company, I've always thought very highly of them when they had things like speaker stands and speaker wall mounts that, I really liked a lot. I was recommending them all the time. Uh, basically, the reason you haven't heard that name coming out of my mouth very often is because a ton of the stuff I used to recommend, they discontinued. Uh, but overall, they've always been rock-solid products. Hmm. So I, I remember us recommending um, Oh, you know, yeah. I remember us talking about Ascend them. Ascend used I, to sell them when they were being made. So Did they have, yeah. did they have like one of those like grab the sides of your speaker one and it made it very easy? I seem to remember something like that. I might be wrong. Anyways. John's theater is open at the back to a kitchen, also to a hallway on the left and the stairwell. And the first reflection point on his left wall is a fireplace, and he has a sliding glass door on the right of his main seats. The walls and ceiling are his flat drywall, and the floor is laminate and tile. So, you know, all of the reflections. <laughs> all of them. So we'd like to put up a room treatments, but he doesn't know where to begin. Can we give him some suggestions? Anywhere, I think, would be a good suggestion to start with i guess i mean first uh, and foremost i want him to get a rug um yeah yes a rug with a thick if a, as thick as you can stand uh, whatever they put underneath yeah and rug. actually later on uh, we might not get to it this week but uh, someone was recommending that uh, ikea has some nice rugs that are one inch thick uh, yeah. And he really, really liked those, and they weren't, you know, crazy expensive coming from IKEA. So, yeah, definitely, sure. I want you to have a rug. You need something in that front section. Frankly, it'd be more comfortable to put your feet on when you're in that sideways facing couch, facing your uh, fireplace. So, rug is there. You're, um, I don't know where. I don't think that you have to worry about first reflection points because I don't think they exist. <laughs> <laughs> well, here. they do, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, you know, I mean, it, this room is very very narrow from yeah. what i can tell it's very well it narrow. looks it because he's got a couch and a fireplace so it, that makes everything look narrower yeah so uh you know i would put you know i don't know do people sit on this couch i guess because it reclines so mm. do they sit on the couch it, it, it's weird okay so for those of you that aren't seeing the pictures there's a two-seater recliner you know home theater seat yeah that has like a uh, cup holders in between the two seats and everything and it that faces the TV. Yeah, and it straight is on. Far, straight on. It's far back. And then in front of that and to the right 
is a three-seater couch that also looks like it reclines. And in front of that, to the well, in front of the main seats again, and to the left is the the uh, fireplace. Mm-hmm. So the fireplace, in some ways, acts as a bit of a diffusion a little bit. For, for that front left speaker. And to the right, the front right speaker, the couch almost acts as a yeah. bit of an absorber for yeah. because it, it's firing like the bottom woofer. You can't even see the bottom woofer on the tower right. speakers on the right because it's firing into the side of the the couch there. So a rug between you and this hot mess. <laughs> I mean that in the and then and it's very nice looking room. I'm, I'm just yeah. You know, this is a hard room to put a home theater in. Yeah, uh, is a rug would make a big difference, and then. Behind, you know, basically the only wall I see that's actually free to do much is the front wall. The front wall. Yeah, by around behind the, the speakers mm-hmm. themselves. That right wall a little bit. Uh, what that picture is up there. Yeah, I mean, be like I wouldn't made want into to. An absorptive panel? I wouldn't want to overly damp the right side wall just because it really isn't feasible to put absorption panels on your brick fireplace. That's that's no. not going to happen. So I wouldn't yeah. want to overly damp the right hand side and make that really uneven. Um, so I would agree the, the front wall you can treat and the corner, the front corners, um, front potentially right even corner for sure. Yeah, the potentially left corner looks like it has rack. something in it, but it's hard. Well, to that's see. where his rack is. Oh, is that where the rack yeah. is? Let me scroll back up. Oh, you're certainly correct. But you could you? you could potentially put some insulation over to that left corner as well because there's room above his rack, and I'm not sure how much space he has behind the rack. Uh, but it yeah, doesn't look your, like much. But your yeah. front your front corners you could definitely kind of super chunk those up uh, as long as that would wouldn't be objectionable aesthetically. Uh, and then the front wall, I mean, you could kind of treat the entire front wall because that way, at least any reflections that are going towards the back and then coming back towards the front, they're all just going to disappear on the front wall if you sort of treat right. the whole thing. So, I mean, that whole front wall could just become fabric covered insulation, the whole darn front wall in the front corners if you wanted to. Um, but there isn't really a ton else. I mean, like we could it's say- Directly underneath the, the, the surround, I guess they're, he's calling them surround speakers that are behind yep. him. Yep. on that wall you could put thin panels back there yep. but i don't know that they're going to be doing a ton not really so, not not that super yeah. no other than just overall ambience reducing some right. echoes in here right. which which is good you want to do yes. that i mean i was going to say we could say ceiling but is that really realistic in here um you know, I did, uh, yeah. maybe, but yeah, I mean, the I rug... honestly don't think there's much realistic in here. I think the rug is about where the for sure, end and of the and that whole darn front wall be. just just cover the whole front wall and put a put, cover it in fabric. Yeah. All right. Uh, how long have we been going? Oh, okay. Randy. Randy has a dedicated theater that is 11 by 15. He also has a pair of SVS PC 2000 subs, which you do with the math here. Yeah. That's all right. Crushes that room. <laughs> yep. That's right. He'll be using SVS Ultra bookshelves and the Ultra Center speakers up front. He wants to wall mount his surrounds. So, do we think we should get a, a pair of Ultra surrounds or just the Prime satellites? Just the Prime satellites. One hundred percent. Yeah, I mean the Ultra surrounds have they're, they're wedge shape. Uh, they're actually a bipole yeah. speaker. You do have the option of setting them up to be um, two monopole speakers sharing right. one wedge shaped cabinet um yeah. but that yeah none of that's really yeah. necessary I, I would agree i'd get the prime satellites and call it a day in this room size for sure yeah you're so 11 by 15 i'm surprised you can even get both those subs in there <laughs> to be honest with you you're, it, it, there can't be a ton of seats in this room and that's fine i mean if it's just you or if it's just you and you know your your spouse or i whatever. did it in a room even smaller so it can be done Yes, well, you know, not everybody has got room's de- uh, Rob's dedication to, sh- you know, shoehorning as many speakers. I, in all of our years of friendship, in all of our years of doing this podcast, I have never seen a picture of Rob's room. I have. Well, no there's the idea ones on this. Facebook. They're old oh, at this point, but they're yeah, up there. Yeah. So, uh, you, I could even if you said to me, I ordered the Ultra bookshelves and Ultra Center. And it is way too big for my room. Mm. I would not be surprised. And I think the prime, the prime uh, bookshelves in the center would also be good in here. So uh, you're you're on the right track. Yep. I the the satellites are not tiny little cubes mm. or actually sure. tiny little rectangles. They are a good size speaker. Mm. I mean, I could take one off the wall right now and show it to you if you really want to, but I don't. But it's a it's a good size speaker. You know, and. Uh, it has plenty of output for the two and a half feet. It's going to be away from your face. Indeed. 
Mike. Mike has an open-ended question. He has recently moved into a new house. He's using the living room as his theater area. It's roughly 13 by 23 by 10, but uh, as always, it's open to the rest of the house. White walls and hard surfaces everywhere, and since the front door is right beside the living room, everyone will be walking through it to get to the kitchen and family room, so seating uh, and furniture need to remain out of the way. It can get fairly dark at night, but there really isn't any light control, so we have a picture here. Family room. So it's kitchen. a big space he's dealing with. It's a big space. And front then... door. So you would walk in the front door and there'd be a little probably half wall to your right. And over that half wall would be the theater area. And past the theater area would be everything else. The family room, the kitchen, uh, all of that. Now, this, the photos I'm showing were taken from a 3D, uh, like a three, uh, 360 degree camera thing. So there's like splices in here that make it look a little weird. His room is not actually like uh, all disjointed and parallel lines are not really parallel. <laughs> if you're seeing it. You must be photos. showing something different than I'm seeing. So <laughs> if you look at some fine. of the details, you're like, oh, that wall doesn't actually oh, attach I see to that wall on that wainscoting. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm just looking at the, uh, the, uh, the overhead. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you walked in the front door, if you turn directly to your right and you step forward and put your hands on that, that, that little half wall, to your right would be the seats and to your left would be the, the uh, screen or whatever. So this is where we're at here. And wow, is that wood floor or tile? That's a strange floor. Yeah, that's a, uh, I forget the name of that type of tile. Hexagonal? But yeah, Hexagonal that's, that's, a, that's tile? a tile floor there, yep. So he's got a little nook-looking thing there, and he's got a TV on a stand, and then he's got uh, bookshelf speakers way out to the right and left corners there. Uh, and that is a 13-foot are... spread. It doesn't look it in the photos because there's such, yeah. such a large space, but that's a 13-foot spread. And then his surround backs are in the back corners, uh, mm -hmm. pointing in, point, angled inwards. So we've got some work to do there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, okay, this, this little... Uh, Winchester mystery house looking thing here because of all the <laughs> weird angles. <laughs> all right. So Mike already owns five B&W 600 series speakers, JL Audio Fathom F112 sub. Dang. Marantz uh, AV705 Pre-Pro Sunfire Cinema Grand 2, uh, Cinema Grand 2, five channel amp, and a 64 inch Samsung Plasma. I love I love that plasma. I don't even know what's all of this, <laughs> but my parents have a Samsung Plasma. It's very nice. But he says he has owned that stuff for quite a while now. He's itching for an upgrade. He's thinking as big a screen as he can reasonably fit, potential for a roll down with the plasma still behind it. And he's open to upgrading any or all of his audio setup. But Mike basically wants to know what we would do if we were in his space, if it, if it were our space to work with. So have at it. All suggestions are welcome. I would kick one of my kids out of their room and take their room for my home <laughs> That's what I would do. Uh, honestly, so uh, the first thing I would do so let me look here that family room uh-huh <laughs> you know that family room <laughs> is could we maybe move everything over there mm. and do it slightly differently but i can't really let me look it's really hard to see the pictures here because he didn't take any pictures of the family room. no right? we only see in the living room and that yeah, was certainly was his wall. his intention to keep everything in there. That's that's very okay. clear. All right, so that's fine. Let's. Uh, the first thing I would do is I take your surround your back speakers, your surround speakers, and I would take a lot of that angle off of them. You have them firing inwards over the top of your your couch. I would angle them back towards each other. Basically, uh, I'm just more. firing straight at each other behind I, your. I, I know you probably don't want your front left and right speakers to be closer to your TV screen, but I would do that as well because I don't yep, really know why there's yep. why they're so quite so wide because the people on that couch. So there's two couches. There's one on the back wall and there's one uh, on the right wall, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, the people on the right wall are never getting surround sound anyway, so <laughs> that's, that's too bad for them. Uh, I would... You can't, can you? I was going to say you can. I would move my... You know, couch forward but i don't see any way of making that happen that's a little bit tricky i mean he was saying there's yeah. there's a little bit of wiggle room but yeah. but not much so yeah so if you're going to upgrade your display you cannot go from a plasma to an lcd as far as i'm concerned it like ah uh, it's well i mean it's, a really good lcd it's you, that's okay if you're going to go like super high-end uh sony or you know samsung, samsung yeah. yeah you could but i would say that you will probably be much happier with no lead. 
But the so problem that... is size. I mean, yeah. 77, uh, they're, they're actually not completely unreasonably priced now. A 77-inch OLED. But at currently, he's like 20 feet away. Uh, I mean, there's no flat panel anywhere that's going to be that sufficiently large to handle 20. I mean, 20 feet, ideally, you'd have like a 180-inch screen. And even that right. isn't... But there's no way I can recommend to you putting a projection set up in here. I mean, I was thinking like maybe you could consider an ultra short throw with the ambient light rejecting screen, but like it just doesn't, it doesn't look that great in this type yeah. of setting. I, I know there are people who are like, I'm amazed it's, it's super watchable. And I'm like, I, for me, I just, I can't, I can't. So I like, I'm leaning to like an 85 inch flat panel, which, you know, there is such a thing as an 88 inch OLED, but it's $30,000. And I don't think he's looking at that much money. Um, but I mean, there are, relatively reasonably priced 85 inch lcds like sony's uh if the current one would be the x950h i can get behind that it's a nice full array local dimming 85 inch uh the only display. way you could go with the this is these, these are the concessions you would have to make for a projection setup it, it, and there would be a lot of them the first is you would have to commit that you were only going to watch it at night uh. You would never be able to turn it on during the day. <laughs> then if you wanted to spend a reasonable amount of money, and it's not even that reasonable, you would have to get something like a JVC, you know, a really nice one. And then you'd have to get a 120-inch acoustically transparent mm. roll-down tab tension screen, which would also not be a reasonable price. And then you would have to place it halfway in the middle of your room. Oh, yeah, yeah. You have and it drop down. Probably smack... Illoon Vision's ambient light rejecting one, honestly, because the, this room itself is problematic with all its white walls and everything like that. Um, At night, I wouldn't worry about it quite uh, that much. I but guess, you're right. But, yeah. but, I mean, if you were going for absolute performance, yes, yeah. you're right. But if but the, the we this at this point would not be about getting, you know, the perfect you know, black levels and white levels and, you know, whatever. This would be about, I'm going from, you know, 65 inches, 20 feet away to 120 inches. Right. You know, but I just, 12 I, feet I just can't get behind a projector in here. I don't think it's the right situation for one. Um, I mean, I, I like the idea of just going sheer size. And for that, you, you can't get an 85 inch OLED, but if, I mean, 77 inches is larger than 64. So if 77 inches will do you, then yeah, I mean, OLED is going to be the picture quality upgrade over your current plasma. Um, so it's going to be one of those, either a 77 inch OLED or an 85 inch nice can we, Sony LCD in my opinion. Can we turn the room? Can we turn this? Can we turn it so that if you actually rotated your couches, not, you know, basically clockwise one tick around so that your long couch that you're sitting on is on the is, half wall with the entrance behind the it wall with that entrance behind it and then you take all your speakers and move them around so that they're mm. normal distances so now you're only 13 feet front to back right then what you in the i mean basically the whole thing mm -hmm. you, you change nothing else mm. none of your gear goes gets changed none of your t your tv doesn't get changed you're now sitting mm. what almost half the distance that you were before your screen has gotten that much bigger. Or in fact, you could just take your two seater that's on the right, move it to the other across. side. And that yeah, becomes yeah. the seats that face forward and your three seater couch remains. Now it's your right hand side couch that could be, yeah. you could do things that way. I mean, either, e either way it ends up being six of one half dozen yeah. another, but this is the, you know, this would be a, a big enough change. And then you could say, okay, I've got. I've made this change. I'm looking at this now, and now I I want to go. I'm getting an even bigger screen. So mm -hmm. you're going from a 65 inch to a 77. 77. But that 77 is going to be massive. And now you can be like 60. 10 feet from eyes to screen, maybe even nine reasonably, because right. there's some depth to the back of your seat, and that TV can be on a stand that's yeah. you know not wall mounted. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, of course, it makes the whole thing feel smaller in that you're essentially just over to one side of right. your current space but in terms of what it would give you for a viewing environment it would be much would nicer be way better and okay. then you could take that other area over there and just put like a coffee table and a couple of chairs yeah. and some candles or whatever the crap it is that people yeah i mean there's kind of things. like a built-in little nook area there nook anyway there, so right it becomes your yeah. like your, your little it's you a know seating what I area I, would, I mean people I people get, always want a living room seating area becomes a lovely would, seating area that little nook right there i would either get a custom made or buy a couple of bookshelf or yeah. a big bookshelf to put in there fill it with books yeah put some chairs 
put a table right there. You know, it's your little. It's just where I. This is where I read the newspaper and drink my yeah, scotch. Absolutely. You know what I mean? This is this is this is a living area mm. over there. I'm kind of down a, with all that, man. A rug. Yes. Please, for the love of God, buy a yeah, rug. Yeah, I mean, this is this is one of these rooms where. In uh, like a, a panels anywhere that you can put panels. I'm not worried about specific reflections at all. No. Okay, not at all. Anywhere that you can put panels, anywhere that you can add a nice thick rug, uh, do so if you can. Um, so we'll, we'll we can basically leave it at that for what quote unquote room treatments would be in here. Um, but now his speakers, his AV receiver or uh, his pre pro. Um, you know, does he need to? upgrade any of that i mean in my opinion no, you don't, don't need to especially if you do rotate the room and you've got a shorter distance i don't think you i yeah. mean those bmw speakers are really nice what i would say is it might make sense for you to get a new pre-pro just because if you're upgrading to a 4k hdr display then your current right. pre-pro can't pass those signals through um so that that might be the only thing but i mean that sunfire amp is still fantastic your speakers are still great if you just want to change we're not gonna tell you any specific speaker right now because that's a personal choice that you need to when we're and able you've been living with bmws which are not known are not designed to be flat frequency response they yeah. they're designed to have a sound yeah. to them which is, is their signature sound and if you love their signature sound it's the onus is going to be on you to go out there and listen to some stuff and say okay i know i liked the, my bmws and i went out and i listened to x y and z and this is what i thought of all three of these now can you give me some suggestions yeah. maybe then we can do something for but what you, you but... can do while you're at home uh is take advantage of the two companies that we always recommend that offer completely free shipping both directions which of course is svs and aperion so that's a completely no risk trial for you if you just want to get a taste of some different speakers than what you've been listening to for the past many years uh then yeah uh, order up some svs and some aperion speakers and have a listen and send them back completely nothing out of pocket I agree. Mick from Australia. This comes from Facebook. Mick. It's the, the, the most Australian name <laughs> in all of Australia. I love that name. I wish my name was Mick. <laughs> well, no, it just sounds, well, my name's Tom. It's like the least exciting name in the world. Well, your name is Rob, so I yep. guess we're in the same boat. <laughs> simple names. Simple names for simple men. Yep. Mick. Uh, from Australia, do the SVS sound path isolation feet really work? Yes. Mm-hmm. Next Thank question. You. On the recommendation, he bought an SVS PB1000. He's very happy with it. And he, was, he is using it in a room with a concrete slab foundation, but the whole house is shaking, mm -hmm. which means his wife is not happy as he is. Will the sound path isolation feet do the trick? They will do it something. They will reduce the shaking. They will. And yes, I, as I was mentioning I, last week, the concrete slab is not inert. It can yeah. absolutely still move in sympathy. Mechanical vibrations if, can absolutely If you're really worried concrete. about whether or not this is going to do anything, get a, a, a yeah. big, thick blanket, comforter-like thing, fold it over itself a whole bunch, put the f subwoofer on top of it, play the thing. Yep. And see if that makes a difference. Yes, because it, it makes doesn't, a difference. The sound path will do the same thing. It doesn't have to be the sound path isolation feet. No. They are just squishy things underneath your yeah. subwoofer. And any sufficiently squishy thing will do the trick. And that can just be a folded up blanket. So you can try this for free before you do it. Uh, if you then think that the sound path isolation feet look nice and are the solution that you want to use, you can do that. But you can also go cheaper. <laughs> you can get some packing foam and just cover it with some fabric and put that underneath your sub. You just need something squishy. Right. You just need something squishy. The the reason why I mean a lot of times we don't we suggest having you know things like mouse pads or whatever. Mm -hmm. And by we I mean Rob mouse pads underneath things uh, to to damp them. Those are light things. This is a subwoofer. This yeah. is yeah. This is going to crush need something that will a lot compress. of things. <laughs> yes, it, if it compresses it all the way to the ground, you have defeated the purpose. So what you know what you you're going to have the subwoofer teetering on the top of this big blanket trying to keep it from. <laughs> you know, to, from falling off, but, uh, it will give you the idea. Now, what does the sound path isolation feet do on top of that? Well, it doesn't lift your subwoofer, you know, six inches off the ground and have it teetering on top of a big blanket. <laughs> it doesn't look like you put a subwoofer on the blanket and it, 
you know, it does the job just as well. And it's designed to do that with these subwoofers. There are other, like Rob said, there's other solutions that you can come mm -hmm. with, uh, up with, uh, including the Oralex, the Grandma Pad or whatever. Which but they cost just, more than the sound path isolation fees. They so. just, well, they might not here. <laughs> they might not in Australia. Maybe. There could be the shipping cost or whatever. Could make it make a difference there. We don't know. So if you find another solution, and we, we're not married to any one solution, yeah. the solution is, you need to decouple your subwoofer. Oh, people have used like those, uh, you know, those piece together gym mats and things like that. Yeah, like, yeah you, you just I've got just a something stack squishy. of them outside. <laughs> I do. We, my son's floor was covered in those things. I've mm. got literally got you know a two foot tall stack of those things outside. They're black and they're filthy. I think they're black. <laughs> they might be black on just one side. They're all. They're definitely one side's black. I don't know about the other side. So he's been using a cheap center speaker for 15 years. He wants a bang for the buck upgrade, but his budget is still limited. He's hoping to find something for around 200 bucks Australian. Mm -hmm. The Andrew Jones, uh, the Pioneer Andrew Jones Center would fit the budget, but would it really be a big step up, or is there something else worth considering? Uh, every time I was in a a, a, a hi-fi shop in Australia, they had a massive shelf full of returns and things that mm. you know dent dent and ship if like i think it was called west coast audio or something like that was one of the places i went to a couple of times and dolly was almost always you know available it would take you going in there and doing a little bit of research mm. uh and maybe waiting that would be a very easy way to get a deal on something that you know is a good bang for your buck now is the andrew jones center better well you say you've had a cheap center but i don't know how cheap is cheap and yeah i mean how, the, is, the how did you get it brand you that know? he's had i have i have never even heard of so i don't i have no uh, okay that's why no knowledge of what his current one is i mean the pioneer andrew jones center um like it's not like the greatest speaker ever what it is is uh, a pretty neutral for the area that it does play it's got some rolled off high um it doesn't play super duper loud but what it does play right. it plays quite accurately um it's tough for me to say that that's really like a big upgrade i don't know how we can answer this question without knowing what those left and right speakers are too though you know because yeah. if we if you suggest something for like just say for example we say yeah the andrew jones is a great speaker you you can't go wrong with it and then you you come back to us and say i put it with my other speakers it sounds so much different than my mm. other speakers the blend is it, it, it's terrible yeah. we're like oh well the problem is your other speakers and you're like well i didn't want to fix my other speakers i just wanted to fix my center channel <laughs> I don't know that we can just fix your center channel without knowing what the other speakers are. Like I've said, there are speakers out there, like an RBH center channel I had, and uh, it was EMP tech, but whatever. RBH center channel I had that played nice with every speaker I ever had until I got one that wasn't very neutral, and then it didn't. Yeah, so it's tough in Australia because the prices are so much higher. Like I was like, Q Acoustics, that could be a good choice. Five hundred dollars for their center, like Australian dollars. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. the the SVS Prime Center is eight hundred dollars Australian dollars. Yeah. It's crazy how much more expensive it is. So I like Tom's suggestion of maybe looking for a returns, a scratch and dent type of thing like that, because you can get something that's much higher quality uh with maybe just a cosmetic blemish or an open box or something like that it's tough just looking on like amazon australia or something like that to find you something that i would really be gung-ho about the the pioneer andrew jones center is a nice neutral this is a great entry level speaker uh but how much of a really worthwhile upgrade for 200 bucks it would be is it's a little questionable to me let's just end it all right who have we got left oh dude oh my god we have so many. What? It's going to take me as long as the podcast to name everybody. We had 23 no. questions on the list this week, man. <laughs> I, I, dude, I've got to be up at like 7 a.m. I, I, I can't. Uh, okay. Well, at some podcast. point, we'll have to do two podcasts then because we have an entire podcast dude, left. So. We did we did th more than three quarters of this A list. lot of that was pictures. <laughs> That's not my fault. I'm so, looking at the little scroller I know bar. you do. We're in the anyway, bottom, okay, so we the got bottom Fred, quarter of this We thing. got Fred C, Raf R, Nick B, Daniel D. Tom K, CJ, Chris T, uh, Dre, uh, scrolling down here, Mike S, Rick G, and Reginald D. An entire podcast is left for next week. There we go. Don't worry, guys. We'll get to you. <laughs> if you want to get your question answered, you want to get in the queue, which yeah. is you know, lining up. But then again, all the, everybody in this queue is staying six feet away from each other, so it's not a problem. <laughs> you know what I've determined? Americans cannot queue. Yeah. That is my, that is that you want to know why the people are, are writing. It's not because we're out of toilet paper. 
It's not because we're out of whatever hand sanitizer or whatever. It's not because they shipped every disposable wipe in existence to another country other than this one because there's none here that anybody can find. No, it's because people standing in line at a grocery store straight up lose their minds. I have seen so many near, like, flat out riots and brawls <laughs> just standing in line at the grocery store in this country. It is insane. People are losing their minds. So, uh, yeah. Our cue, though, very orderly. I, <laughs> You guys are killing it. I, I listen, listen. Killing it. Giving you the round of applause. All right. Uh, I want to thank our listeners of the week. Uh, I'm going to thank Chris, Neil, Dre, and Michael for going to uh, avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and uh, giving us a PayPal donation, as well as our 109 patrons over at patreon.com, including Terry and Benjamin. Indeed, Chris, Neil, Dre, and Michael, thank you very much for your PayPal donations. And thanks so much uh, to our 109 patrons over at patreon.com slash podcast, including Terry and Benjamin. Thank you, guys. I just want to thank Ash for sending us some updated artwork. Daniel uh, for sending me a Roku. Eventually, I believe it will happen. Dre for talking us up to Acoustic Panels Canada. And notes of gratitude from Daniel and Mike. Indeed. Ash, Daniel, Dre. Daniel, I think, was a different Daniel. It might be the same Daniel. Who knows? All Daniels and all Mikes. Thank you very much for the support, guys. It's very much appreciated. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Mandry. And I'm Rob H. Now go out. No. God, I screwed it up again. You see, I'm tired too. That's what happens. Stay in and listen to something, folks. Stay in and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.